Hi everyone. So Divya, thank you so much for being here today, and thanks all of you for joining us today. So on behalf of the Art and Artisans Group, affiliated with Global Challenges Forum and Integrated Learning Institute for Sustainable Development, so I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Divya Sharma. Divya is an art practitioner based out of London. She has earned her bachelor's honors in painting from the University of Arts London and is currently completing her master's in sculpture from the Royal College of Arts London. Divya's art practice seeks to understand the idea of identity and belonging. Her interest in studying post-colonial nationhood, migration, multiple identities, various cultures, and world politics has meant going back to understanding her own idea of what it means to be an Indian-born British citizen in the world. Her talk today is inspired by the V&A exhibition in London in 2004 and is a nod to a world that was no less connected than it is now, a world that was brimming with curiosity, wonder, and fascination for the exotic. That is a world that still celebrated the other. Understanding the past through the art, imagery, and objects of the time, she thinks is a unique way of conceptualizing the present and how we got there. So I present Divya Sharma on the world that is from 1500 to 1800 AD. Thank you for being with us today. Wow, thanks Kushi. Thanks for the uh, lovely introduction and um, thank you and your team from the Arts and Artisans Forum for inviting me and giving me this amazing opportunity. And before I begin, I must do some basic housekeeping. I should let everybody know that this um, session is going to be recorded and it will be put, um, uploaded onto YouTube. Is that, is that it, Kushi? At some point? Yeah, at some point it will be uploaded onto our website and YouTube. Thank and you. YouTube. Yeah, so just to, to let everybody know. And if you have any like questions, uh, please do um, type it into the chat box so that maybe um, after the session we can go over it if we have time, hopefully. So um, let me start. So like Kushit said, I, um, I've, I've been on this journey of self-discovery, self-expression and self-healing, to, so to speak, with my art. And um, and when it's been, I've been going, uh, doing this for the last 10 years now. And when the lockdown happened because of the COVID problem, like everybody else, I'm sure, I too kind of uh, took a good look at myself and did a kind of recalibration of uh, priorities, so to speak. And then realized uh, much to my relief that I have been on the right track. But I also realized that I had to kind of push myself harder. I had to kind of bring myself out of my comfort zone and do something that was quite challenging in terms of engaging with the wider world, with a topic that was, um, that gives me a lot of joy, a lot of meaning and, all, and a lot of, um, and that's something that I'm really interested in. So to that extent, um, I know many people know this, but I started this um, series of podcasts called Articulate, where I interviewed about um, 22 um, artists from different places in the world. And um, they are in different stages of their career. Some of them are like um, students still in college, some of them in mid-career, and some who've been quite established and uh, holding really responsible positions in uh, reputable art organizations. So it was a really um, eye-opening and quite a liberating experience for me because uh, for that one, um, hour, one hour that you are engaging with them, you kind of completely forget the restrictions that you, you kind of um, are in a kind of digital cloud, so to speak, and you completely um, understand another person who still then was a stranger to you. So when that happened, I thought that, you know, when Kushi got in touch with me and asked me to do something for the Arts and Artisans Forum, I thought that I should do something uh, to continue with this momentum and uh, kind of put the spotlight on myself and um, talk about something that really interests me again, like I said. And um, yeah, so um, I'm really glad to, um, to probably start this and hopefully continue with some more talks later on. And thank you all for um, joining me today. I know it's a Sunday and I know you come from different parts of the world and uh, thanks for spending this hour with me <laughs> and supporting me. So I'm so grateful. 
Um, like Kushid said, I, I have been trained in painting and I'm currently doing my um, sculpture masters. So I can, I call myself a multidisciplinary artist. And my art practice, um, it kind of uh, spans over different processes and mediums. But what kind of ties them together is the research that I do for the projects that I undertake. And the themes that I, um, I usually like to work on are like post-colonial identity, post-colonial studies, um, feminist studies, world politics and culture and world events. So to do um, justice to, um, these themes it's really important to uh, read up on it i don't do enough but i should i keep um, reading up on history and art history and um, you know go um, talk to art historians and curators and one such art historian that i really admire and follow is uh, someone called dr amin jafar and he was an art curator in the victoria and albert museum for some time and now he's gone on to do other things but but I have used um, uh, his imagery and some of his research and thinking in the presentation deck that I have um, made for you today. And um, like Kushit said, this presentation is inspired by the b &E exhibition, you know, the Victoria and Albert um, exhibition in London in 2004, quite a long time ago, but it was, it's quite relevant even now. And it, it was called Encounter, Encounters, the Meeting of Asia and Europe. And it was curated by Dr. Amin Jafar and um, his colleague, Anna Jackson. So this exhibition was a, an amazing blockbuster. Um, um, it was an amazing success. And um, it was received really um, quite, um, it received really, really rave reviews. And it was one of its, its kind because it brought to light the confluences of different cultures through beautiful objects and paintings of the 16th and 17th century. And it was about looking at Asia from, an, um, uh, from a Western perspective and looking at the West from an Indian perspective, but in the context of the 16th and 17th centuries. So there have been a number of interesting books that have been released um, in the past few years in India from authors like Kavita Singh, uh, Ira Mukoti, Manu Pillai, etc., that add to the repository of information already available to us. So like every, you know, generation thinks that theirs is the most cutting edge with the best innovations and advancements in, uh, in every field. And it is true. But for me, um, I think it's really uh, exciting and, and it's really important also to go back into history and kind of um, put ourselves in their shoes and see what they thought was cutting edge, important, valuable um, and, um, and fashionable. And, um, and these beautiful objects and paintings, of course, they are, you know, um, we can only access them through museums, but then through these objects and paintings, they kind of provide a channel, a link, a portal for us to go back into time and, um, and paint a sort of picture of how life was then. And I genuinely feel that the events of the 16th and 17th centuries kind of were so influential that they we still it still resonates to this day and we still feel the the you know the consequences of events that happened um, in the 16th and 17th centuries so for me it's important to go back into time and go back into that period of time and and see um how things evolved and of course i'm doing a really broad strokes um presentation i'm not going into much detail because because it's only for one hour. But I feel um, it's so interesting to, um, it's a very unique way of looking into history, but through art objects. So India post 1400 and the Islamic um, invasions when the Europeans arrived was a period when there was a lot of trade happening between Asia and the West. And one sees a syncretic um, system of beliefs where different cultures incorporate el incorporated elements from each other, whether it was architecture, textiles, technology, fashion and art and design. So it was a period of dynamic um, interactions between different cultures as new lands were being discovered. Print technology enabled innovative interactions between word and image in forms such as illustrated books, pictures inspired by texts and maps which can combined um, image and texts. So I talk about a past that finds the world no less connected than it is now, but there was a sense of wonder and fascination with the idea of the other in quote. 
So it was a time when new sea routes were being discovered when earlier it was the legendary Silk Route, which was the link between, east, between the East and the West. And Vasco da Gama, the famous Portuguese explorer, was the first European to reach India by sea. His voyage to India was the first to link Europe and Asia by an oceanic route connecting the Atlantic and Indian oceans, thus connecting the West and the East. So this talk also, also shows how the first Westerners were viewed, their mannerisms and features observed and captured as caricatures in art objects. On the other hand, the, in the West, Japanese lacquers that arrived in Europe were so valuable that they were mounted in royal furniture, and Chinese porcelain objects were richly mounted in gold and silver gilt mounts. This was because they were exotic and strange and represented different worlds and technologies. I use the word exotic a lot in this, in this presentation because during that time, exotic was what was um, um, what, what, what made things so different and so fascinating. So um, another reason that this exhibition was um, so important was because it kind of um, addressed the misconceptions and the issues that was raised by this book called Orientalism. It was written by um, uh, Edward Said, and he was a political theorist. And this seminal book, which came out in the 80s, talked about how the West has fetishized and eroticized the East. Here, the term East includes societies from and peoples who are from Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East. And it's definitely linked to imperialist societies that colonized many of the same societies. Through history, the Western civilization has perceived the Eastern part of the world as inferior, extravagant, backward, childish, illogical, decadent, debauched, as opposed to how the West has been projected as scientific, logical, progressive, rational, democratic, etc. So the, like I said, the idea of this exhibition was to redress this misconception. And uh, this is so significant considering what is happening today. I mean, no culture evolves in isolation. Talking about really simple things like we, we had no put tomatoes in Asia and Europe and what is Indian food or Italian food without tomatoes. There were no potatoes in Europe or even green chilies in India, which was brought in by the Portuguese. So some things are so deeply embedded in our cultures that we forget the stories of their origins. So going back into history will open up some of these issues that we still face today in 2020. So that's my introduction. On that note, let me start sharing the screen for my presentation. Yeah, so this is a painting uh, of a beach in Calicut where Vasco da Gama and his entourage would have landed. This is the scene where they would have, that they would have encountered. As I said earlier, throughout history, Europe and Asia have had interdependent economies and exchange of Asian commodities, particularly natural products like pepper, cinnamon, cardamom, and cloves, etc., were reaching Europe as well as more luxurious objects like silk, lacquer, and porcelain from China. But these goods traveled over very long and slow and arduous journeys over treacherous seas. The second painting is a spectacular one that is from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam by Johannes Bixbroom. And it shows a view of the Malabar coast again of Kerala. And this was the site that was captured by the Dutch East India Company from the Portuguese in 1663 and later they lost to England. We see Dutch ships coming into the area that was Dutch owned at the time. And when you, when you take a closer look at the ships, you see their, their flags and in the distance, the settlement and the style of architecture, some of which still, that still survives today. This was the sort of landscape the Dutch would have seen as they settled along with the coast, uh, along the coast, along with many other competing European trading powers. So this is a romanticized version of the perilous journeys that people undertook from one end of the world when they got onto, wooden, onto these <clears throat> wooden structures and sailed all the way across dangerous waters in search of profit and adventure. In that context, it's good to know that Vasco da Gama returned with profits 100 times the value of the goods that he first brought. So let's take a closer look at the map that will orient us a little bit. 
Long journeys that were taken around the African continent, where there were several stops taken and then sailed towards India and the South and, and Southeast Asia. Items of interest in particular were spices like cloves, cinnamon, pepper, teak, etc. And it gives you a sense of the routes by which commodities travel to the West, either overland through the legendary Silk Route or the coastal route along India into the Persian Gulf or across the Arabian Sea into the Eastern Mediterranean and then into Venice, eventually to Amsterdam and London. But in 1453, with the arrival of the Ottomans, this route was closed. When what Vasco da Gama and his team set out to do is to find a new route. This is the same time that Christopher Columbus set sail with the theory that by sailing west, he will eventually arrive at the east. And of course, he was right. But he, of course, hit America first, as we all know. So and if you see the map, the next one, in the south of India, there's so many rival European companies that are competing with each other. You have the French, Dutch, Danish, uh, British, of course, Portuguese, um, competing with each other in such close quarters, just um, concentrated in the south of India. One of the earliest commodities trading from the east to the west has been pepper. I believe we still find in southern India Roman coins representing this trade. In 1453, like I said, the eastern Mediterranean is blocked, blocked by the Ottoman Turks, who take Constantinople, that is present-day Istanbul, and they begin to regulate and tax ships trading in the Middle Eastern Mediterranean. And this means all of a sudden pepper prices go through the roof. The supply of pepper is diminished. And as you can imagine, if you're living in the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy or France without pepper, life changes very significantly. So the Portuguese, along with the Spanish and the French and the English, try to find a more direct route to source the spices that are absolutely essential for their daily life and sustenance. What you see here is the cultivation and production in the Malabar coast. It's a completely unrealistic image, but it gives you an idea of what Europeans um, imagined happened when they thought of pepper. The first thing that happens when the Europeans arrive in the south coast of India is that they're taken to the local ruler, the king of Calicut. For the first time, this direct meeting leads to misunderstandings of business and customs, mutual curiosity and mistrust. So the first encounter is really a diplomatic encounter. The Euro Europeans coming to trade on Indian shores have to learn and navigate the court culture of Asia, which is very different from that of the West, of if Europe, rather. We have an image from the Badshah Nama, this current one, the illustrated manuscript of the life of Shah Jahan, of the court of Shah Jahan, where you can actually see the emperor under the canopy throne, surrounded by his closest family, his sons. And below the railing are his courtiers. And outside the railing are a group of very light-skinned Europeans. And they are holding gifts in their hands. So the most important diplomatic etiquette of South India, of South Asia, was the exchange of gifts. The gifts were often sent beforehand so that the emperor or ruler knew how to receive the foreigners with their requests. This painting is clearly very propagandist, as it shows Europeans being very insignificant, which at the time they were when they arrived, because they were still new and finding their way around Asia. But the big, big problem was that they arrived with very poor gifts. They had no idea of the rich splendor of South Asian culture. And we know now that Vasco de Gama's first encounter into Calicut ends in disaster. There is a military escalation between them and the locals. And the reason is because he had very poor quality gifts with him. He arrived with poor European fabrics, oils, and some very simple things that the king of Cal Calicut refused to believe that he was re representing a great nation that he claimed because his gifts were so poor. Finally, I think I, I read somewhere that he had to get the king of uh, Portugal to write a letter to the king of Calicut after which the problem was resolved. And this is an image of a few hundred years later, but gives you an idea how, of how things were conducted. It is an embassy from the Dutch governor to the King of Kandy in uh, Sri Lanka. Europeans had to kneel and prostrate themselves before the ruler. The ruler was almost always considered semi-divine or projected himself in a divine way. So there was a, a whole ritual of paying respects, which the Europeans had to accept and master. It wasn't very easy for them, and they considered this as humiliating and insulting. 
So what we see here, in fact, is that they are trying to present in the engravings and books that they uh, that were published after their visit, which is very different from the actual relationship that they had struck up. So here we have a Dutch engraving of an early modern period, early 17th century, showing a Dutch merchant shaking the hand of the King of Candy. It's very obviously different from the previous slide. And in this engraving, the Dutchman is trying to show that he is on very equal um, terms and status and showing that they are shaking hands, which uh, we know that probably would have never happened. This probably would have been commissioned by the, to increase the confidence of the D uh, Dutch investors who used to pay for the commercial ships going to Sri Lanka to, tr to trade there. By shaking hands with the king, he's saying that he has an accord with the king and he is on very good terms. Even with the British, it was known that they became very close to the rulers in order for them to be able to trade with India. The environment um, of political stability by the Mughal rule in India, better law and order conditions and favorable attitude towards commerce definitely helped in the expansion of European trade in India. Upon arrival, after close to a year of traveling, Thomas Rowe, the British ambassador to, the, to Jahangir's court, learned that the Portuguese were, in quote, pressing a treaty with the Mughal emperor, which would result in the absolute exclusion of the English from all ports of his empire, end of quote. Thomas Rowe had thus landed in the midst of a raging commercial competition in which he would have had to work very hard in order to further English interests. So gift giving was one, if not the first way of engaging in negotiations aimed at obtaining the emperor's favors and trading privileges. I mentioned gifts. This was really the bedrock of all these uh, ever-growing relationships. From the Asian side, one thing that was routinely sent to Europe was exotic animals. What you're looking here is a 16th century object. It is a small stool made from the bones of an elephant sent from India to the Holy Roman Emperor in the 16th century. So when the elephant died, it was made into a piece of furniture and you can see coats of arms of the Holy Roman Emperor, as well as the life story of the elephant etched into its bones. Really weird. So this is another example that's um, in the Louvre in Paris. It is a mother of pearl box made probably in Gujarat as a gift. And the King of France gets it mounted by his best goldsmith in the latest fashion. And this has been in the French uh, royal collection for many centuries now. I show you these examples to talk about how gifts were important and really central. But perception and propaganda was as prevalent then. This is a painted textile made in China in the late 18th century, and it shows the gifts sent by the English embassy to the emperor of China. The English have apparently sent globes, artillery spears, scientific devices. But what is interesting is that the Chinese text in the painting says, like others before them, the English have now come to pay homage to us at the imperial court. Although the gifts are mere trivialities, we treat our visitors with generosity all the same. So basically they did not care for much, care much for the uninspiring gifts. Although there always was a sense of hierarchy of status and cultures, there was also mutual fascination and mutual interest. This is a lovely miniature painting showing Jahangir with the Shah of Iran, Shah Abbas. The painting style is very European with cherubic angels flanking them, but it clearly shows the meeting of two great kings. They are all holding examples of European made decorative objects like the Venetian glass. There is a Christian religious object along with the meal there. So it's very clear that these presents from the West were of very good quality and were very highly prized. This is a parallel image from the same period of a European art collector showing in the late 16th and 17th centuries, examples of Chinese porcelain, uh, exotic shells from the Far East, as well as globes. So this, there is definitely evidence of passionate collecting of objects from the so-called in quote, exotic other on both sides of the globe. Here we have an earliest example of porcelain that would have come to the West uh, from China. We are so used to seeing the, uh, the idea of porcelain, but we must remember that in the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, it was only China that 
uh, it was in only in China that porcelain was produced. The rest of the world was using earthenware, stoneware, or metal for eating. And these are very simple and unsatisfying compared to this luminous bone-like porcelain that the Chinese made. So the left side is a porcelain vase that comes into Europe in the 14th century via the Silk Route. And it was so highly prized that it was set in gold for the Pope by the King of Hungary. So this tale of, of the porcelain vase gives you an idea of the exotic curiosities that come in from, from, from Asia and make a terrific impression in Europe. This is a painting by Giovanni Bellini, a Venetian artist. It's called Feast of the Gods and depicts ancient gods and goddesses holding a banquet. This seems a fairly straightforward, straightforward depiction of a classical subject. But look a little closer, you will spot three pieces of Chinese porcelain, which seem quite out of place. Chinese porcelain was a sought after item by European princes in the 15th and 16th century. And in the 15th century, porcelain did not come directly to um, Italy from China, but through the Silk Route through Persia. It was transported along the Silk Route, accompanied by other precious items sought after by um, European rulers, such as diamonds, precious gems, silks, and spices. The fact that it had come from faraway places was also part of its value, as was its association with trade, travel, and diplomacy. The cult of the exotic and the different and the other is dominant in this period. An example of the lens of which this was extended is this one. It's a magnificent piece of silver of the 15th century, but it's made around a very humble object. It's made around a coconut shell. The coconut's curious form and obscure origin in faraway lands supported the idea of using the odd shell of the nut as a medicinal antidote. For instance, poisoned wine could be neutralized by drinking it from a coconut used as a cup. So an object that in Asia was a throwaway that is cast aside on beaches by the millions made its way into Europe in the 15th century and was mounted lovingly in a cup and prized. And this particular cup has been kept in the treasury in the collection of New College Oxford, where it has been for the last 500 years. And it was not only ob exotic objects that were traded that made the, the other interesting, but also technology. Here we have a miniature painting again of Shah Jahan standing on a globe. It's clearly an allegorical painting. He's really demonstrating his mastery over the world and his, and his name of course means Lord of the world. But the painting gets its meaning also by the gun he is holding. It's the weapon he holds that gives him the power and that new weapon and the new technology comes from the West. It's very clear that when the Europeans go further east into Southeast Asia, China, and Japan, it is principally the arms they bring with them and their superior military know-how and technology That's, that makes them important. Firearms in Japan were introduced in the 13th century by the Chinese, but it did not develop till the Portuguese firearms were introduced in 1543. So this is a Japanese manual that teaches how to use a gun. Of course, again, it's a completely unrealistic image, but it gives you an idea of how the importance of this weapon changed the face of Asia. Europeans also come with an Im for the, came with a message. They came armed with Christian iconography. We must remember that Christianity was not unfamiliar and they, there already were monastic and papal visits uh, throughout Asia. And in China in the 14th century, there were already Christian monastic communities. But when the Portuguese arrive in large numbers, they come armed with papal authority to convert all the heathen natives to Christianity. And in some measure, they are successful. They're particularly successful in Japan this is, this is a fantastic painting of an altar of the 16th century showing the Madonna and child that was painted by the school of Japanese painters in Kyoto. And to give you a parallel in India, this is a jade crucifix inset with precious stones and is a great example of Mughal jeweled workmanship for the purpose of propagation of Christianity during the Mughal period. We know that Akbar, 
was interested in other religions. This is a miniature painting again made probably in 1600 with Akbar seated in his textile throne in the evening having a discussion with leaders of different faiths. We know who these leaders are. They are the Jesuit missionaries Rodolfo Acquaviva and Francisco Henriques. This is probably, probably in his Ibadat Khana. And for people who don't know, Ibadat Khana is the house of worship that Akbar specially built to learn about different religions in Fatehpur Sikri. We know that Akbar and Jahangir were curious about Christianity and were promising to promote it. They were also interested not only in the religion, but in the, in the imagery of Christianity. The arrival of Europeans to Asia leads to a transformation in how art is made through the introduction of painting and enameling techniques and jewelry techniques, as well as forms of representation. Here is an etching of Saint Cecilia, a saint who meets a tragic end. Here this engraving is showing her in her last moments, but with Jesus up above in the heavens. In the next picture, you have tr this translated into a Mughal miniature painting by a Mughal um, court artist who puts it in a page full of calligraphy. The combination of the Western style used in Eastern paintings, of course, is a subject of many, many studies. This fascination to the point of imitation is an immediate effect between this encounter between Asia and Europe. Another example here is from the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's a Mughal miniature painting of an Elizabethan gentleman. Mughal painting in India was closely associated with the personal tastes and art appreciation of three great rulers of India, Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Akbar's great achievement was the creation of a distinctive school of painting. During his reign, he established an academy in which about 100 Hindu artists worked under, under the guidance of Persian painters. Gradually, these painters developed a style of their own, which combined Persian, Hindu, and European elements. European influence was introduced into India in 1580 by a Jesuit mission, which brought with them an illustrated Bible and pictures with Christian images. From, from such European uh, paintings, the Mughal artists borrowed shading and aerial perspective. According to the story, when Thomas Rowe, the British ambassador, presents Jahangir with this painting, Jahangir appreciates it but asks his court painter to copy it. It is believed that he makes eight copies and then asks Thomas Rowe to find the original, which Rowe could not identify. So the point here is that Indian craftsmen were quickly mastering Western techniques in art. On a larger scale, the arrival of Europeans in Asia forced Indians to confront their perceptions of the world. Here we have a 17th century globe made in China for the Chinese. Although there's a perception that the Chinese were close to trade during the 15th century, we know that they were interested in science and technology and commissioned European craftsmen to work for them. This is a globe made for the Chinese ruler to show him what the world really was like according to Europeans. And I say according to Europeans, of course, because the Asian perspective of, of the world was a different one. This is a Maratha, <clears throat> Maratha map of the late 18th century, a very rare surviving document. And it shows India made by its rivers. And on one side, we have England, France, and other hat-wearing nations. What characterized, Europe, uh, characterized Europeans in India was the hats. So grouped in one was um, other hat-wearing nations on the left side, the Topiwala complex, the foreigners. And on the top of the map, we have the Hindu concept of the world. It's very much a schematic rather than a real representation of the world. We find the same from East Asia. This is a Korean map, which represents the world from a Korean perspective. It shows China and Korea and the center. It also shows Japan. And there's a sea which isolates them and places them in the center of the world. The rest of the world is outside and in inferior locations. The Japanese were the first to confront the reality of the Western cartographic tra tradition, which developed quickly in the 16th and 17th centuries, which led to advancements in navigational technologies that led people to travel to different parts of the globe. So this is a Japanese screen, which has the map of the world based on an uh, European engraving. And it shows on one side, different peoples of the world. The problem in Western interpretations of the world map was that Japan was always shown at the edge of the world. 
So very often these screen maps, which have, have been reconfigured to put Japan in the middle of the world, because it was a shock to such an advanced civilization that they were in fact not in the center of things, but at the edge of things. Technology was a fundamental aspect of the dialogue between Asia and Europe. Whereas Europeans were really after spices, food stuff, or finished products from Asia, it was Asia who wanted very little from Europe other than precious metals and know-how in science. So this is a gift from the English to the Chinese emperor in the 18th century. It's a richly worked telescope with, with a clock attached to it. The Japanese closed all trade with the West from 1639, but they were quite, um, they were still absorbing uh, Western books about medicine, science, and technology. And this is a book with Japanese translation about the anatomy in the 18th century. Science becomes very fashionable also because it was rare. This is a painting of a beautiful woman of, a, of the court of the Chenlong Emperor of China in the 18th century, a typical romantic painting of a, of a Chinese woman at her desk, shown with a European style carriage clock. It probably was the most uh, stylish object you could own in the late 18th century in China. It was imperial, it was rare, and also it represented a new way of looking at the world and a new way of measuring time. And the Chinese were very open to Western astronomy and the Western way of marking time. But there was also decorative aspects of technology that transformed Asia. One of them is the introduction of the mirror. In much of Asia, it was polished metal that was used, at, used for looking at oneself. Europe perfected large mirror plates in the 15th and 16th centuries, and they started to export mirrors to Asia commercially. And they also start to use mirror in diplomatic gift giving. So when the Venetians come to, to the court of Jahangir, they bring mirrors and the mirrors are priced and they start to be incorporated into paintings. So here we have a painting of a Raja, he has a nimbus or a halo around his head and he's seated, seated on a throne. And what is he doing? He is looking at himself in a Western mirror with a Western frame. Mirrors also seem come to be used in interiors. This is a building uh, which I believe no longer exists, but it was from Bhuj in uh, Kutch, Gujarat. It was also made in the late, early 18th century by an Indian prince who was very clearly fascinated by Europe and sent his craftsmen to the West to learn how to make mirrors. And he comes back and builds his palace called the Aina Mehel or the mirror palace. And inset into these walls are these European mirrors and European chandeliers and Western style tiles. So there was a complete fascination for Western design and technology. The fact that the dialogue about technology was so important both for Europeans and people in Asia is shown in this Japanese scroll painting in the late, um, the late 18th century. We have three people seated around the table, a Confucian scholar from China, a Japanese scholar, and a European who are looking at a book on anatomy. What's happening at the background is that there is a blazing fire. The Japanese are scratching their heads to find a way to put out the fire. The Chinese are running away and the Europeans are putting it out through a water pump. And the Japanese painter who creates this is portraying the consciousness of Western superiority in terms of science in the late 18th century in Japan and shows how the ancient ideals no longer hold up in the modern world. Well, this was not a one-way street. This painting is one of thousands that was, that was made in Europe in the 18th century. They are called conversation pieces. This is the name given to a type of group portraiture. Works of this sort are usually small in scale and depict relatively informally a group of family members or friends. They are sometimes but not necessarily engaged in conversation. A large new middle class emerged as Britain's colonial um, empire expanded and its industrial revolution began. Socially sp spurned by the aristocracy, these wealthy merchants, industrialists, and colonial landowners developed their own more natural and casual manners that made perfect themes to enliven both novels and group portraits. Artists such as Gainsborough painted conversation pieces. So this painting shows a family man with his wife and, his, um, and they are drinking from a Chinese porcelain cup and they are drinking tea. 
Tea, of course, was a huge import from, sorry, export from China and later from India to Europe. And that was not alone. It was accompanied by coffee, which was exported from the Arab world, and chocolate, which came, which was coming from the South of America. And all this meant a whole new way of consuming beverages in Europe. It was believed to have medicinal properties, but above all, it was very expensive and rare. So tea drinking, as we know, becomes a kind of obsession in Britain. So the point here being that beverages are made from spices in the East and they transform the West. The relationship with India also led to a, a revolution in textiles. In Europe, textiles that were worn were very hard to make and not very versatile. We are talking about velvet, linen, damask fabric that had to be woven very slowly and carefully and couldn't be decorated very easily or washed very easily. What happens with the arrival of Vasco da Gama and Calicut is that we have huge quantities of Indian cotton, which are still called calico, as a result of coming to Europe. Not only white plain cotton, but embroidered cotton. Cotton is versatile. It can be painted, decorated, embroidered, washed easily and dried easily, pro produced quickly. And above all, it is not expensive. For the first time in Europe, thanks to this Indian textile, all classes of people down to the poor could wash more regularly and change their clothes and maintain hygiene. It leads to complete changes in habit, uh, habits regarding sanitation, epidemics management, just because of the arrival of cotton from India. At a higher level, of course, we have muslin, which leads to changes in fashion in the late 18th and 19th centuries, mainly from Dhaka, Bangladesh. And of course, we have Kashmir shawls. And these textiles from India revolutionize Western fashion. But we must not think of it as only one-sided. This is a Japanese kimono made out of European silk. So there was a fasc fascination both ways for the textiles of the other. And it was really, of course, Indian textiles that changed the West. Consuming commodities and other works of art from other civilizations led people to, con to question themselves. This is a Chinese drinking bowl and shows a noisy scene of Europeans drinking. In the middle of the scene, one of them has passed out and they're all drinking and smoking because one of them has a pipe in his hand. The Chinese craftsmen who, who made this wanted to show the difference in behavior between the Europeans and the Chinese. So on the other side of the same bowl, you are shown the Chinese drinking tea and having a very sedate philosophical conversation. So the idea of the other becomes very present in this encounter. This is one of the scrolls of scroll, um, series, sorry, series of scroll paintings, which were commissioned by the Chen Long Emperor in the early, early 18th century. In fact, showing different kinds of people of the world. And this is a detail from the same scroll. It shows the British who are holding the bottle and the Dutch are also shown holding the bottle. So the Chinese text explains that the Dutch and the British are great merchants and great drinkers. Great stereotypes about people were being formed and perpetuated in the early 18th century. The Japanese did it more elegantly in their portrayals of in their objects. This is a food box which shows the Portuguese with their billowing clothes, above all their long noses. So long noses becomes a big feature that distinguished Europeans from others. So it's not only curiosity that leads to connections. It's more than that. It's the mutual sense of wonder and fascination for the exotic other. The emperor of China is portraying himself with a wig and a cravat, and he wants to make himself look like the king of Europe, like King Louis. So there is a joke about how this emperor in China was the first cosplay emperor due to his seeming fondness for dressing up in foreign period attire. Even more interesting is this image here. It's a woman of the Chinese king's court, probably is a concubine of the king. What's interesting is that she's not only wearing Western armor, but Western male armor. So a Chinese portrait of a Chinese woman who's dressed as a Chinese man in a Western armor suit. It's almost a fantasy and make-believe of the other world. This is Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis in France, and she's in her boudoir in her chateau in France and has painted herself in a, as a Turkish queen. So this idea of engaging with the other's exotic fantasy become, comes to dominate. And this was not only at the aristocratic level. Here we have a Japanese samurai coat that would have been worn over armor, painted in this vivid graphic colors of a European ship. 
like in the 80s, Japanese letters on t-shirts and clothes were very fashionable to use. It was the same for the Japanese in reverse. It was a kind of obsession with depicting Europeans. And this is again one of uh, Japanese screens showing the arrival of European ships, and it shows in great detail. They are screens made by the Japanese for the consumption of Japanese. People in Asia were curious about the West. It was not just restricted to Japan. This is from a city palace in Udaipur from the 1720s. And there were a number of visits to Udaipur by the Dutch particularly. But after their departure, these exotic, curious people with their strange clothes and strange ways come to be represented as curiosities of fashion and in interior decoration. And this is a, the same picture from a wider lens. The whole European way of looking with perspective starts to influence Indian paintings as well. So Rajasthani paintings in, of the 18th century with European style perspective dominates. And we know that this painter is really showing off his skills and how he masters the new trends of painting from Europe. Then we get to see more hybridity with Nawabs sitting on cushions, but hanging up their portraits in European frames. So we come to see here a real fusion in interior decor. Interior decor changes very dramatically with these large mirrors and chandeliers. Objects that are traded begin to feature in paintings. And now they're no, um, they available commercially and they're no longer just diplomatic gifts. Of course, it was underpinned by personal relationships. At the end of the day, the relationship between Europe and Asia was transacted principally on Asian soil with the arrival of the Europeans. So this is a painting of an English man called Palmer and his Indian wife. And this painting has, been, has caught them in a very tender moment in Bengal in the 18th century. But what's curious here is how he is sitting on the chair and his wife, the Indian, is sitting on the floor. So there's a great change in lifestyle that people in Asia made because of the European presence and European political dominance in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's characterized by some of these charming paintings. This painting from the British Library shows an Indian woman in the 1760s seated on a chair, but she's sitting on a chair like she's sitting on the floor. And of course, her hookah can no longer reach the floor as it's kept on a height on a stool. So it's a wonderful picture that captures the fusion in lifestyle and material culture between the West and the East. While the Englishman of the same period and the same time, James Fullerton, is attempting to live an Indian, in an Indian style, but of course, one thing he cannot do, despite of the smoking of the hookah and having all the attendance, is to bring himself to sit properly on the floor. So the question of how people in South Asia and Europe met and conversed when they have such a different way of behaving and sitting and being is a very fascinating subject. We know from records that early Euro Europeans complained that they had to sit on the floor and they had to take off their shoes and that was really a big problem for them. But what um, happens when the British come, become more powerful um, politically is that they begin to demand the right to sit um, on chairs, and that makes huge changes. For example, in Bengal, Indian homes start to have sitting rooms in their homes to do business with Europeans, where no other member would go. So in this picture, the Englishman and the Nawab are both on chairs, and so it becomes a more normalized way of doing business and um, living. Of course, there are some rare instances when Indians went to Britain and made their presence felt. This portrait is of a Bengali gentleman, Sheikh Dean Mohammed, who comes to Britain in the late 18th century and the early 19th century. He opens a spa using Indian medicinal oils in Bath. And eventually he opens the first Indian restaurant in the 1830s. He is very successful and becomes very wealthy and he um, is treated like a gentleman, as you can see in this painting. On the other way around and much more frequent, we have Captain John Foote who goes to India and becomes very important, but he dresses up as a Nawab and brings back, sorry, his Indian clothes with him to wear in Britain. Here this portrait shows the King of Awadh wearing a Western style crown. The crown was a rarity in modern India. Among Hindus as well as Muslims, the turban was the royal headgear of choice. Ancient uh, Hindu kings had worn multi-peaked crowns or mukuts. 
But some of the last Mughal emperors wore elaborate crowns. But this, uh, this show of wealth seemed to have symbolized weakness, not power. Drawing heavily on foreign influence, they represented a last futile protest against their loss of power to the, to the European interlopers, that is people who become involved in a place that they do not belong. This is a last attempt for the, of the king of Awadh to rep represent his power in terms that the Europeans could really understand. And the mirroring of one culture to another is complete. Here we have the ruler of Awadh, Ghazi bin Haider, in his palace in Lucknow. He is wearing a Western style crown, but he still has his nimbus, nimbus or halo around his head. He is wearing an ermine cloak and sitting on the table in a Western manner. Sit seated around him is the East India Company resident and his wife. The court is made up of a mixture of Indians and Europeans. He is an Indian prince who is very westernized, though holding on to the last vestiges of power. So we have a mirror imaging going on with the princes in Asia trying to replicate the fantasy world of the West. And last but not the, the least, the Diwani. This is a document that is really rare and uh, really poignant because this is when you know that um, three of the richest provinces in India were handed over to the East India Company in 1765. The document not only gave a veneer of Mughal legitimacy for the company's conquest, it also potentially gave the East India Company the right to tax 20 million people and generate an estimated revenue of between 2 million and 3 million pounds a year. So a massive windfall by 18th century standards. With the stroke of the pen, in return for a relatively modest payment of 2.6 million rupees, the last emperor of the Mughal dynasty, Shah Alam, agrees to recognize all of the company's conquests and hand over to it the financial control of all of northeastern India. So colonization was well underway. Before long, the East India Company was straddling the globe. Almost single-handedly, it reverses the balance of trade between the West and the East. So this is the end. In conclusion, I would say that this talk is evidence of commonality of human response to something that is different or foreign. It was the same sort of curiosity, fantasizing and exoticizing of the other on both sides. It's interesting here that all of the objects, um, lifestyles, food or technology, the, in, in all of them, the idea of the other in quote is celebrated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Debbie. So, um, do we have any questions? No questions, just compliments. I can't hear you. Oh, God. Kushid? Hi, Divya. Hi. So I've finished. Any questions from, from anybody? I can't hear you. You have to unmute. Prabha pra Prakash, you have to unmute. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Your artwork was beautiful. Thank Wonderful. you. You have become a great artist, and <laughs> with your with your uh, conversation of history, stories of history, you took me to that century. I yeah. felt as if I was uh, in the in a museum. Yeah, it, it is it, from a museum. Uh, yeah, so beautiful, so intricately done, everything. Thank lovely, you. lovely, gorgeous. Proud of you, dear. Thanks, Santi. We'll have this conversation after the call. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had to give my compliments immediately. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> so, um, I, I just have, uh, yeah, can I yes, just please. say something? Yes. So I'm Manisha Singhania and I'm from uh, India, Hyderabad. Hi, Manisha. Uh, this was a very uh, interesting presentation. And uh, um, I'm a yoga therapist and I travel outside India 
to conduct workshops and today i was like really thrilled to see one of the paintings where you said that they could not sit cross legged <laughs> and you know i this was really interesting for me because uh, even when i travel so they they asked me even now can you please show us how to sit cross legged so it was even depicted at that time in the paintings that was very interesting for me thank yeah, you divya it was yeah thank you i mean after moving here i think even we find it difficult to sit on the floor we're so not used to it anymore so can we yeah. uh, conclude yeah there's a question uh, uh i i quite oh. enjoyed enjoyed it hi i'd not got the video on but i'm ananda uh, and uh, hi uh, uh yeah this uh, the whole talk was from a very his western historical lens uh and it didn't pro probably capture much of the the indian historical framework maybe um any comments particularly why you chose that option um like i said i follow this um his art historian dr amin jafar so most of my um ideas and images were from his um books and his um talks so i guess because i liked what i saw in his work i just kind of used those imagery and and i it resonated with me and i thought it kind of um brought home the point of how um there was a confluence of influences during the 16th and 17th century and it was and it was a century when um you know trade between east and west kind of started and uh, the whole of history of Uh, of this region kind of change so i thought it was quite relevant but i guess yeah, yeah. Um, i could yeah, have... what i'm trying to say is that uh, it's kind of seemed like um, you know um, we did nothing we did not know much and it's just the europeans who came and taught you to do everything somehow that lens seemed to be a little a little um, uh, uh, you know uh, the historical lens maybe was from one prism okay no but actually the idea was the opposite it is is to say that um uh, the europeans came and changed and kind of uh, overrode many of our learnings and our own history by because of their political power it was it yeah was but uh, there are places so sorry i i think we'll just i'll just take one more question there are places when you know you have mentioned that scientifically it was not important or they did not have any signs uh which may not be true because uh if you if you were to rewind a little more and go a little back backward into history mm -hmm. you will know that many of the scientific books moved from india to the to europe uh to arabia and then to europe yeah. and then came back so yeah. i guess uh <laughs> yeah maybe a little um background for that it has uh, because i used see the, the thing is you i wanted to talk about history through art so when you choose certain objects and paintings and you kind of weave a story through them you mm -hmm. kind of you have to kind of stick to that particular right indo right so right. and and the idea was to say that there was an a status of equality there was before colonization happened there was a sense of wonder there was a sense of fascination there was no kind of judgment more like it was a curiosity mutual curiosity true by the time true. colonization happened and politically they became more powerful then the hierarchy and all the you know yeah true the kind of so thank you yeah so kushit do you want to like um say any last things any last statements no i'm good i just want to thank you so much for coming on speaking i mean part of this and we hope you give many more talks for the thank art and artisans group thank you <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you thank you so much. thank Thanks you a lot well done thank, thank you all you. for um, joining me bye bye Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank It was you. a pleasure.